All right, so we're going to start off with a Christian prayer. Um, so in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Father, please come be with us tonight and introduce into our hearts the desire to learn about one another. Help us to not only listen, but to understand what we are hearing. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity for multiple communities to become one and for us to come together for your greater good. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And we'll make dua as per our tradition in Islam. I begin with Bismillah in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Ya Allah, I ask you to send blessings upon the messenger Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, and his family and his companions and his followers. Ya Allah, bless this gathering today. Ya Allah, guide us. Ya O oh, Al-Hakim, the wise one, purify our intentions to meet for our sake and reward us for the work that we are about to do together. We ask Allah to guide us so that our every act of service for the community is done to worship you. Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, Al-Shakur, the one who appreciates, we send your blessings upon the people who had a role in creating this space here that we share today, from those whose stories we know and those whose stories we do not know. Indeed, all praises to you, Ya Allah, Allahumma Ameen. All right, we're going to thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, we're very excited to see how the night turns out. Uh, my name is Jordan. I'm a senior here at St. Thomas, and I am on the Tommy Catholic Planning Committee. My name is Yusuf Mahmoud. Uh, I am a senior here at St. Thomas, and I am uh, the president of the Muslim Student Association. So what is Tommy Catholic? Tommy Catholic is the gateway to everything Catholic at St. Thomas. Tommy Catholic started as a collaboration of the Office for Spirituality, Catholic Studies, and St. Paul's Outreach. Now in its fourth year, Tommy Catholic is a weekly gathering of students who want to grow deeper in their Catholic faith. The evenings are planned by student, or for students by students. Um, and events have included everything from an adoration night to a talk by Bishop Cousins to a discussion about the Catholic Church's take on aliens. So what is MSA? MSA was first founded here at St. Thomas, actually following the 9-11 attack. And Dr. Karen Lang was our advisor. Uh, the purpose of this association was to foster a strong Muslim community on campus and promote awareness of Islam among students, faculty, and staff. Uh, of the University of St. Thomas as the Muslim population continues to grow here. They host club meetings in halaqat, which means like study circles where we get together and reflect. Uh, and for community building and times of reflection on Islamic principles. They also, we also host events like these specifically to promote awareness and events surrounding Muslim holidays uh, such as Ramadan Iftar, which is coming up next week Wednesday uh, 7.30 in this room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so maybe if this works, does not work. Uh, faith leads a believer to see in the other a brother or sister to be supported and loved. This is the very first sentence on, of the document of human fraternity for world peace and living together. This document was signed less than three months ago by Pope Francis, the leader of the Catholic Church, and the Grand Imam of Al Tsar Ahmed Tayyib. Um, this shows that this conversation is bigger than us. This conversation is going to be bigger than this event. And it's happening between the people we look up to and admire. And it's kind of our time to become involved in the conversation. So, what is the ultimate objective of tonight? Tonight's discussion is called a theological exchange. Um, it's, a t it's a level of interfaith dialogue. Uh, it's neither a debate, nor is it that kumbaya type of stuff that you often see. Um, rather, it is actually a real conversation between two people who respect each other. Uh, here, you'll learn to speak about differences without the feeling that you're trying to convert the other or the other's trying to convert you. Uh, here, you will see how people can speak about their differences that to show that your disagreement would not be perceived as disrespectful. Uh, rather, it is to achieve on our campus civic pluralism, which means that the, div di the diverse communities in the, on this campus actually engage with their diversity. 
And before we introduce our academics, I just want to um, let you guys know that there are slips of paper on your tables in front of you for you to take any notes about anything interesting you hear about tonight or any additional questions that you might still have after the night's over. So first, Professor Ali Shamsuddin is a practicing Catholic from Lebanon where he first found his interest in interfaith by growing up in a religiously diverse family. He is a current theology professor here at St. Thomas, teaching courses in Theo 101 and Islam. He has his license in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas, also known as the Angelicum in Rome, and is currently working to obtain his doctorate from the Angelicum within the same field. With his special specialization being in ecumenical and interreligious studies, Professor Ali finds that his background affords him the opportunity to connect with and build bridges of understanding between diverse communities. Dr. Hamdi As-Sawaft received his BA in psychology from Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, and he got his master's and PhD of psychology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. As-Sawaf is a psychotherapist, an imam, a consultant, a professor, professor, and an adjunct professor currently. He is the founder of Al-Wafa Center for Human Services in Minneapolis, and a co-founder for many Islamic institutions. Per uh, an example would be the Islamic University of Minnesota. Dr. As-Sawaf serves as the advisor board member for Center for Religious Inquiry. He is also the vice president of Eastside Neighborhood Services in Minneapolis. He's a public speaker in many Islamic conferences held locally and nationwide. He gives lectures on Islam in public, private schools, colleges, universities, mosques, churches, synagogues, hospitals, and clinics. So let's welcome up our two speakers for the night, um, Dr. Ali, and, or Professor Ali and Dr. Hamdi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, I want to start with this greeting because I would like to emphasize that this greeting is not only for Muslim. We find it also in the Bible when the angel Gabriel appeared on Mary. So she was greeted by that greeting. So it involved Muslim and Christian. Uh, thank you for being here. And I would like to first, before we begin, to talk about what I've learned about dialogue. In order in, to enter in dialogue, I need to listen to the other. So hopefully tonight, I'll be able to listen to Dr. Hamdi in order to dialogue. And also I would like to wish for the Muslim community on campus here uh, a blessed Ramadan, especially that Ramadan is getting close. And I would like to start with this question for Dr. Hamdi. Why Ramadan is very important for Muslim? In the name of Allah, most gracious and most merciful, I would love to greet all of you again with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings and mercy of God with all of you be with all of you. It's really an honor to be with you uh, tonight at St. Thomas uh, with uh, uh, Professor Ali, with that wonderful dialogue we'll be having. Uh, this is not the first time to be in St. Thomas. Uh, I have been a regular speaker in St. Thomas for almost, don't be surprised, uh, before some of you were born. Now it's almost 29 years or 30 years. So uh, being with you tonight and having this wonderful uh, uh, greeting from Professor Ali and wishing us the blessing of the month of Ramadan, um, we'll be observing the moon by the fourth or fifth in order to cite, to cite the uh, birth of the moon. Uh, the lunar calendar uh, goes by citing the moon. It would decide for us when would be the beginning of the month of Ramadan. Uh, month of Ramadan, uh, fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam. Uh, it is ordained by us, uh, for us by God Almighty to fast the month of Ramadan down to dust. Not only to feel hungry or thirsty, 
but to feel that pinch of hunger, many, could be millions of people, especially children, by the end of the day, they won't find uh, a fresh of a sip of water to drink or a piece of food to eat. Once you feel that pinch of hunger, you do something for those who are in need. And in the meantime, it is a wonderful and a great self-discipline. If you could be away from your biological needs, like food and drink, you train yourself to be away from many other bad things around you. Drugs, bad behavior, nasty things. So with that wonderful training for 30 days during the month of Ramadan, you'll be having this. The other part of celebrating the month of Ramadan, it is where the Quran, the 114 chapters, was revealed to the Prophet of Islam, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And of course, some of you say, uh-oh, that's not what we learned. Quran was revealed to the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, in 23 years. 13 years in Mecca, almost half of the Quran was revealed to him by Angel Gabriel. And the other half in al Medina, 14 years. So it is not during the month of Ramadan. No contradiction. Can I intervene here? Please. Dr. Hadi? Please. I don't want to add to you, but as a Christian, and I, uh, I was curious enough to wanting to learn about this one, especially that whoever doesn't know from, of you, my father is a Muslim and my mother is a Christian. So I live in both religions. And I think one of the misconceptions of uh, Ramadan is most non-Muslims would believe that it was during that month that the Holy Quran was ascended on the Prophet. And instead, what I know, and to rectify I'm wrong, it was during that month that the Holy Quran, Al-Wahh al hafiz were descended to the lower heaven, not to Earth, not to Muhammad, to the Prophet Muhammad, but to the lower heaven. You're yeah. absolutely right. This is exactly what happened. The whole Quran from beyond the seventh heaven, kept by God Almighty, created for the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, to be born, came down to the heavens, down, 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 waiting for Gibraltar, the uh, angel of the revelation, to bring it down to Muhammad within 23 years, according to whatever the situation is, or the need is. But he was a human being, Muhammad, a prophet, he cannot have 114 chapters in a matter of a fraction of a second memorizing the whole Quran and teach it to the whole community. No, he's a human being. So you got to have it. Like when you're studying for your courses in order to have your degree, you have to go through how many years and how many classes, how many semesters, and so on and so forth. So no uh, contradiction between this and that. The whole thing came down, waiting for Muhammad, and then Jibra take the wahi or the revelation to the Prophet of Islam. You got the right answer. Congratulations. So, what is the difference between the Quran and the Bible that the Christian uses as a revelation? So, you said that the Quran was ascended to the Prophet Muhammad. What is the difference between the two? In Islam, from the in, Islamic perspective. As a matter of fact, when, when you view the six pillars of faith, we have the five pillars of Islam. Five pillars of Islam, God, one Lord the worship, Muhammad is the messenger, and the prophet. Second, the prayer. Third, fasting. Fourth, hajj, pilgrimage. And fifth, it is the uh, charitable contribution. These are the five pillars of Islam, two brands. Six pillars of faith, again, believing in God, his angels. You believe in all prophets and messengers, from Adam, Till Muhammad and anyone in between. So you believe in them. So if you do not believe in all of them, you really are, are breaking one of the code of the belief system. And also you believe in the revelations. Whatever that revelation is, Torah, Old Testament, New Testament, Bible, uh, Zabur to Dawood, we Muslims believe in all of them, no matter what. Some people say they are not the same. It's not my business. 
Some people have done whatever, revision. This is not our business. We believe in them as long as they came from God Almighty to all the prophets and messengers. This is one thing. It is really make some people, uh, non-Muslim, confusing. You believe only in the Quran, and that's it. No. We believe in all prophets. We believe in all revelation and the scriptures coming to all prophets and messengers. So you said that Adam and all the prophets. Now, we'll, we'll, I'll start to get into the topic a little bit. And so, how, as a Muslim, how do you see, uh, uh, how do you see Jesus in this life? Good question. Is he a prophet? Is he a messenger? Is he a son of God as a Christianity? Again and again, as, as a prophet and as a messenger. Period. And as, um, surprisingly enough for, for all of you, how many times uh, Elisa, the word Elisa, Jesus was revealed in the Quran. Uh, 22 times by Muhammad, a prophet of Islam, only four times one of them, not Muhammad or Ahmad. Ahmad and Muhammad are, are the same. This one thing you, you keep in mind. And, and also, yes, as a prophet and as a messenger, not God, not a son of God, yes. And uh, refer to him in the Quran as. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, 14 times. Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, 3 times. Isa, the old days, Isa by itself, 9 uh, times. So you got all of his teaching, all of his miraculous birth, uh, will come to this in, in detail. And even the miracles he himself have done Take him as such, but, but the belief there my phone is set up for <laughs> so for the sun the sunset prayer, uh, which is the time now. But we have a wonderful debate, uh, all of us, uh, Professor uh, Ali uh, myself, um, when we're going to have the Muslim prayer? It is time now to have it. Can you imagine we just had about seven minutes discussion and we'll have a prayer for our Muslim prayer and then come back? No. We decided, scholarly speaking and Islamically speaking, the Aisha time, the night prayer would be at uh, 9.51 and will be done in here by Mind, I should say, we still have enough time to pray the sunset prayer in congregation there, and you would be observing us. I will be leading. Anyone who would like to join, that's fine. If not, you could be seated in order to see the Muslim prayer there conducted here at St. Thomas University. They don't have to run to one of our mosques to do it. No, we're going to do it here. Of course, with your permission, just as one. one uh, I think I, I just wanted to say. So back to Isa, uh, it, it is, by the way, what I'm sharing with you is not my opinion. When it comes to my view, I tell you, this is my view, or this is my opinion. But I'm referring to all of those answers from the Quran, verses of the Quran, and I will be reciting some of them, and I will refer this in chapter such and such. This is a verse such and such. So this is the way how we will look at it. So my question to you, now, since you already asked me five questions, it's my turn to ask you a question. How do you view Isa? Well, this is the core of the Christian faith. If we go to the creed, in the creed we say that the Christian, we, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, and true God from true God, begotten of me. And here I would like to emphasize the perspective that the Christian perspective is very different from the Muslim perspective, from what you said. 
First of all, in Islam we heard that uh, Jesus is a prophet and a messenger. Meanwhile, in Christianity, we believe that Jesus is not a prophet. He's not a prophet. And all the time, uh, even Jesus himself in the Gospel doesn't identify himself as a prophet. So the four Gospels show us how he was understood that by that way, that he is a prophet. And he did not identify himself that way. Rather, if we read in Matthew, he says, John the Baptist fulfilled this role, that role. So Jesus doesn't identify himself as a prophet, it was a people. And uh, instead, Jesus, as a Christian, we believe he is a suffering servant. So the suffering servant is very central to the Christian faith. And the suffering servant, uh, his vocation is to suffer, of course. And the essential characteristic of the suffering servant is his vicar vicarious representation. So he is suffering on behalf of. And that's how we believe the Christ is in Christianity. He will suffer in the place of many. And this is done, of course, he did that, well, uh, he did that without anyone pushing him to do that. So it was a volunteer act. And also the suffering servant, he reestablished the covenant between God and his people. And here I would like to recall uh, Saint Ephraim. Saint Ephraim, he is from, uh, he's a Syriac saint and one of the patristic in the Catholic Church. And for who doesn't know what is a patristic, it means a doctor in the Catholic Church. Uh, he used to say that sins entered the world with Adam, and sin was removed from the world with the new Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who voluntarily took uh, this upon him to suffer on behalf of men. So in Christianity, you don't see Jesus as a prophet. So no reference whatsoever in the Old Testament or the New Testament saying that, yes, as you said, Jesus is the Son of God and God, People. but also a prophet and a messenger? He is not a prophet or a messenger. He came to complete the prophecy, but he didn't bring a new prophecy. Um, so I would, I would, uh, I would love to bring. I, I, I have no references in the Quran saying that he is the prophet and the messenger, uh, and it's very, very, very clear that uh, in many verses of the Quran either mentioned as a prophet or as a messenger or a prophet and messenger. That's more than that. Yeah, but Jesus himself in the gospel he didn't say that he was a prophet. He said that John the Baptist fulfilled that. Now Dr. Hamdi, okay. uh, you mentioned Isa uh, in the Quran uh, as a prophet and messenger. Did he perform any miracles? Great question. He did, as a matter of fact, in, uh, in um, uh, I would refer you to chapter 5, uh, verse 1 and 10. This is only one verse, but we have many other verses talking about uh, the miracles of, of Isa uh, in the Quran. إذ قال الله يا عيسى بن مريم اذكر نعمتي عليك وعلى والدتك إذ أيدتك بروح القدس تكلم الناس في المهد وكهلا وإذ علمتك الكتاب والحكمة والتوراة والإنجيل وَإِذْ 
أخلق من الطين كهيئة الطير بإذني فتنفق فيها فتكون طيرا بإذني وتبرؤ الأكماء والأبرص بإذني وإن تخرج الموتى بإذني وإذ كففت بني Keeping in mind, he was born miraculously. Okay. And when his mother took him to her people, and of course they accused her of committing other things. Of course she couldn't answer. She couldn't say anything. But she pointed out to him. And you're born really. And you wanted him to speak. And Isa miraculously spoke up. So he spoke in the cradle. Yes. Qala inni abdullah. I'm the servant of God. But with the miracles itself, he grew up. How God has helped him, guided him to do all of this. Isa, remember, when Allah will say on the day of resurrection, O Isa, son of Mary, remember my favor to you. And to your mother, when I supported you with a ruh, Jibreel. Jibreel. So that you spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. And when I taught you writing the wisdom, the power of understanding, the Torah, Old Testament, and the Injil, the Gospel. And when you made out of the clay a figure that, like that of a bird, by my permission, and you breathed into it, and it became a bird by my permission, and you healed those born blind and the lepers by the permission, my permission, and when you brought from the dead by my, my permission, and when restrain the children of Israel from you when they resolved to kill you. As you came into them with clear proofs and the believers among them said, this is nothing but evident magic. This is what we learn from Quran about Isa and his miracles. In order to say that, yes, he is the one for those miracles from God. By himself, he cannot do it. But by the help and permission and grace of God, he can do that. This is only one verse one. of the Quran, though you have a whole similar uh, verse of the Quran talking about some other things. That's you have any miracles from Muhammad? For Muhammad, yes. Tell us. The miracle in the Quran, I think. Yes. So now if I want to look at the Jesus and Christianity and his miracle, now we'll ask, we heard the Muslim uh, talking about how Jesus was doing miracles since his, he was born. Uh, in Christianity, we believe that Christ has a two nature. Jesus Christ has a divine and a human nature. And it's by hypostatic union, so it's not the one that absorbs the other. So also in Christianity we believe that Jesus did miracle, and in order for Jesus to do a miracle, it was behind his ordinary capacity as man. So as a human being, no one can do miracle. So it's a divine intervening. I think it's similar to God to what we find in Islam. And even in the case of Jesus, uh, his human power, uh, power 
by his human power, Jesus should not do it any miracle. It was by his divine nature. Because in Christianity, we believe that he had both nature, human and divine. And uh, it's, to do miracles, it's only belong to the infinite divine power. So it's not the human power to do that. Uh, but what we have in his human nature is serving as an instrument for the divine power. Uh, we see, for example, the human nature only involved in the miracle. For example, he scratched his hand over the leper, he molded the clay, for example. So this is his divine, uh, his uh, human nature being used as an instrument for the divine. And that's how he was able to do a miracle. Now, God the Son in his divine nature, Christ in his divine nature, is the one who is curing the sick. He is the one reviving the dead, the dead person, as I mentioned in the Quran, too. Uh, so, Jesus is elevating the activi activity of his instrument, the activity of his human nature, to be on the range of normal activity. So technically now if I raise my hand and someone of you is sick, it's not going to be healed. I don't have this, I'm not an instrument of the divine. I hope one day I'll be an instrument for the divine nature, but I'm not. So he was using his human nature as an instrument for his divine. And also the ultimate purpose of the miracle, I don't know, I think, what are the ultimate purpose of the miracle in, in the Quran? Why he was in the most miracle? Because mainly for, for any prophet or any messenger, uh, when he comes to his own people, if you do normal things, uh, ordinary things uh, in front of them, some people would, would challenge him uh, and, and saying that oh, I can do the same, there is no difference. Like in the mood of, of the time of uh, uh, Ibrahim, and he would say, I, 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 I can do whatever. Uh, you you want to make people uh, alive or even die? Okay, I, I can do that. And he order one of his guards and say, Bring me that person. Say, This person is alive, okay, I seek him for your life. I can him make him die, kill him. Now he's dead. So this is my order of mass. But the challenge came to him saying that Imma Allah yati bi shamsi min al-mashriqi fa'ti biha min al-maghrib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought, bring up sun from east. Can you bring sun up from west? Fabuhit al-nadi ta'ala was stunned. So miracles has to be performed in front of people in order to tell them yes I'm the prophet. Yes I'm the messenger. Yes, I'm a human being, but with your concept in Christianity, the divine aspect, but in Islam, by God's power, permission, I can do such a thing. So, so this is the purpose, and this is the wisdom behind yeah. it. So I can conclude that the main purpose of the miracle in Islam, when the prophet in Islam or messenger does a miracle, is just to give but first it's by, by God decree, by God willing to do that. And secondly, to give authority to his message, right? That he's transmitting to the people. Can I assume that? You know, it's... it's because uh, normally as, the prophet is persecuted, even in Christianity. Yeah, as, as, as we all know, um, some of the human beings are really arrogant, paranoid always ask for the proof for such and such. Or can, can, can you show me such and such? And, and, and that's why, you know, if, if you study the life of prophets and messengers, each and every single one of them had miracles. Moses, for instance, with Pharaoh. When all the magicians around Pharaoh uh, would do the magic and uh, put Moses in a very bad situation, and so on and so forth. God told them, you have your cane in your hand, say, yeah, uh, drop it in the floor. And what would happen to it? It would eat up all of the imaginable snakes on the floor. This is now the power of the miracle of God. Or you still have the same cane in your hand, yes. And you, you, you're leaving Egypt, 
to go to Sinai Peninsula? Yes. And in front of you, the Red Sea, yes. How are you going to cross that Red Sea? While Pharaoh and, and his soldiers and his army behind you, they are going to kill all of you. They will never leave any one of you alive. What God told them, Moses, you still have your cane in your hand? Yes. Miracle, yes. Hit that sea with your cane, it would be split. And there is a road paved to you, you and your followers cross to the other side. Pharaoh and his soldiers tried to do the same thing. Following them, what happened to the sea? They were sunk. Miracles got to be performed no matter what. In order to move to those organ people, disbelievers, if you do not believe in God, if you do not believe in the prophets, believe in the prophets and messengers of God, here is my miracle, God's miracle, divine one, as you said, or the power and permission of God. So people would say, so that's why the magician of Pharaoh, when they saw what Musa said, they said, now we believe in you, and we believe in God, we do not believe in Pharaoh. And of course Pharaoh said, how come now we obey him and disobey him? I will kill all of you. So miracles in the of the prophets, in the messengers, when you read it, the Quran and the Bible, there you will find uh, many of them. And we have to believe in them. Like it or not, they are real. They are real. It happened. Otherwise, when you say, a newborn baby in the cradle, and his mother is pointing to him, say, Isa, speak up. I'm in a very, very bad situation. I've been accused of committing other crime. I need to speak up. Huh? Miracles got to be. So, you know, in Christianity, for us, in Jesus, the ultimate purpose of the miracle is to rouse the face in the person who are seeing the miracle. So, kind of it's similar to the perception as well. Yep. Question for you. Tell me. Is there original sin? That's very... I think it's a very important question, Dr. Hamdi, because I think this is here where we find the difference between Islam and Christianity, where the whole difference lay between Islam and Christianity. Uh, first, in Christianity, of course, there is original sin. And just for who doesn't know, or reminder for us too, what is original sin, uh, the original sin, we believe that God created the human being Adam and Eve on his image and likeness. And I think this is said in the Quran too, right? So he created them and he wanted to share his divinity with them. And by the way, there is the sin is not the apple. It's for your information. If you want to know how the Christian came to associate the apple with sin, original sin, it's because of the Latin translation of the sin which is similar to fruit, and later became similar to apple. So this is how it came to this understanding. Anyway, back to the original sin. God created Adam and Eve, and he wanted to share with them his divinity, his love. And he told them, you have all the freedom, except you can eat from all this heaven, except one tree. And he didn't name what is this tree. It's known as good or bad. Or... Anyway, from my perspective as a Christian, I believe the original sin of Adam and Eve is saying, God, we don't need you. We don't want you. We can't be God of ourselves. And I think this is where the original sin came. This was a temptation. And by doing that, rejecting God in their life, they became sinner. They mark their, themselves, and they became sinner. And this mark had consequences on the next generation. So yes, we believe in the original sin, and we believe in the consequence of it. And therefore, we believe that we need the suffering servant, who is Jesus Christ, to repay. And I'll talk later about it, why we need the suffering servant. So that's the original sin of Christianity. That's, that's, that's true. That's um, uh, a major difference between Christianity and Islam. There is no such original sin. We're born uh, 
tool and it depends actually on the way you are profiled. Yeah, so some people will be born to a Christian family, they become a Christian family because the teaching of their folks, their parents, their relatives are uh, born to a Muslim family, I I become a Muslim or, 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 or a Jewish. Till later when I realize what is going on around me and I will keep more of reading, more of understanding, more of figuring out what is going on around me. And I say, oh yeah, you know, being a Muslim, you know, the teaching of Islam makes a lot of sense. Continue, keep going as a Muslim, or a Christian, or a Jew, or, uh oh This doesn't make sense to me in the teaching of Islam or Christianity or Judaism. I got to figure out what, what else. So that's why you find even some people would totally be out of the three uh, sacred religion, Abrahamic religion, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, and say, oh, I, I don't believe in any one of them. I believe in nature. I believe in myself. I believe in science. I believe in whatever. Till I find out later, or I don't find out, so I, I, I would go this way. And this is the beauty of how we're created this way, according to the teaching of Islam, with my free will, I choose according to what I learn. I could learn right, so I would go to the right path. Or I could learn wrong, so I would go to the wrong way. Still, human mind and your free choice and your freedom <coughs> to choose. But not to live your life predetermined for you, I do have that for you. So that's why it's, that difference. This is, is another also you're opening now a little bit on another topic which I think there's also a lot of misunderstanding between Islam and Christianity. The free will. Their free will is everything determined or not. And just to give an idea about what is sin in, in Christianity. Let's say you cut your hand. So the sin is this cut. And you go to the doctor and he heal you and you're good. But you will have a mark forever. Right. So the sin is this cut that by your own choice you made it. But it will keep a mark. And the sin of Adam and Eve, the original sin, kept the mark in the humanity. Even if there is a free will for the human being. And that's why we believe that we need salvation. We need someone to come and save us. And this salvation was wrought by Jesus Christ, who is God becoming human being. But in, by, but in the teaching of Islam, given that I am mentally, psychologically, and emotionally able and capable of choosing my way of life. So now I am choosing. But if, if I'm not mentally stable or psychologically, or emotionally, I do something, but someone who commits suicide, because he's suicidal, because he has diagnosed with, with the severe depression. I, I do not blame him or her, because this is, this is the way. But my free will, given that I am able and capable of choosing this way, not this way, but also keep in mind, with the guidance and help and support of God for you, of God for you. This is one major thing. So the belief system got to be there to guide me which way I should go. Should I go to the right direction or to the wrong direction? And definitely, I will pay the consequences for that. So, Dr. Hamdi, in Islam, was Jesus crucified? Good question. Um, the answer is not mine, but go back to so that you said, or the woman chapter, it's for uh, 157. Literally. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُ Never be crucified, never be killed, but it came to their imagination someone like him who was killed. And see So what happened? To to Jesus, to Asa. to Asa. 
by the power and will of God now receive you as our prophet and a messenger. We will never let anyone, whoever that one is, or any power, any authority to kill you. We will raise you up to the heaven alive. And you will be there till the day of judgment. But we will send you back to earth. This is a wonderful belief in Islam. Once it is bad, say, welcome Jesus to the planet of earth. We believe in you. We believe you along with all prophets and messengers and with Muhammad as well. So we're waiting for his second coming. Are you? Are we? Uh, of course we are waiting for the second coming. Which really... But, but wait a minute. Being crucified or alive? Okay, so... How is it going to come back to life? So, for Christian, Jesus definitely was crucified. Even he yeah. died. Yeah, he did. Okay. He was crucified. He died, and also he was risen from the third day. To the third. Third. Uh, third. end. He was risen, uh, and then later, after 40, after 50 days, he was ascended to heaven. Okay. Now, was Jesus crucified in Christianity? I will answer yes, and I will say why. Uh, but before I do that, one would ask, was it necessary for God himself to become a human in order to save humanity from original sin? God is the omnipotent, omniscience, who can do whatever he wants. Why he can't be human being to save humanity? And this is one of the questions I hear a lot from Muslims, honestly. And to answer that, I would like to speak what St. Thomas says, St. Thomas Aquinas. And he says, you see, in the, that there is two kinds of necessity. The first is the absolute necessity. And this necessity means that the goal is impossible to, to be achieved without this particular course of action. And the second kind is the relative necessity, which means that the course of action makes it easier to achieve the goal. Now, when it comes to the salvation of the human being from original sin, which Christianity believed that it exists, yes, of course, it wasn't necessary for God to become a human being to save the human being. Because he is the only power. Only power. But it is a relative necessity. It makes it easier to be achieved. So the incarnation was not absolute necessity. And to our salvation, because God in his infinite power could have saved us in a different way. He could wish that and it would be done. It is relatively necessary because it is a suitable way for our salvation to be accomplished. And here I would like to give you, for, uh, and to the audience, let's say you are a judge. And we know God, one of the beautiful name of God is the just and the merciful in this love. And same in Christianity. We believe he is just and merciful. So Dr. Hamdi, you are judge now. I'm your son. I was captured stealing. And you're going to judge me. Would you be going after your being judge judge and be just with me? I would resign. Or say, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm not supposed. There's a conflict of interest in you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's the way. As a human being. As a human being. Exactly. 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 And the system won't allow me. Even the laws are not allowed. The system won't allow So, yeah. you resign. And you know that your son, I'm going to be judged by not a judge, but your friend. You want to be merciful to me because you're my father. So what do you do in that case? I, I, I can share with you one wonderful example having read the uh, prophet and messenger Solomon. I'm sure you know the story. When two moms had a dispute about whose son is this, and that is, it's my son. And the other lady said, no, 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 Solomon, it's my son. It's okay. Fine. If you do not tell the truth, here's what I'm going to do. Bring me a knife. Bring me a whatever. I want to split into two halves. 
and I'll give you half, and the other one would have half, and would be fair and fair generalization. Guess what the real mom said? No, don't do that. Give it to her. Right now he said, you are wrong. Because you do care about yourself. Exactly. See now, as a human being, when it comes to that judgment, when it comes to this, you know, we have to be, to be extra, extra, extra careful with this. But the question, I, I'm, I would claim that I'm a good student of learn. I, I, I study as much as I can, as hard as I can, being involved for more than 30 years in inner faith and multi-faith dialogue and activities. I kept asking myself this question, and I would love to ask you this question, uh, 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 Professor Ali. Isa was crucified when he was God, or son of God, or just a human being. He was both at the same time. Both. Both. God. Totally 100% God and 100% human being. But how come human being would kill God? Well, now this bring me back to the story I was telling you about the judge. I'm not by the way challenging. No, 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 I know. Keep in mind, know. folks, we're learning. All right? We're not trying to, yeah, I mean, both one is wrong and the other one is right. No. No. I, I, I'm no saying this. I did not find an answer, so that's why it is my most of opportunity now to ask Professor. I hope I'll be able to answer. Yes. So the judge, now I'm being judged for stealing. Uh, what would the sentence be? It would, should be equal to the act that I did. Like I sold $10,000, I should pay at least $10,000 to be released, right? If I kill the person, what the sentence would be? Most of the same that. Again, for the sake of argument. Okay. Wh whatever he was. So why why they crucify? So there must be a balance between the wrong that is done and the atonement or uh, the satisfaction of this wrong or offense done, and justice is required. And this brings me back to the original sin, and this is where it's hard to explain it. For a Muslim, why Jesus, God Himself, had to die. Because it had to be equal to the wrong that has been done, the original sin. Which, for a Muslim, he cannot rest it because it doesn't exist in Islam. Now, the, there are two types of satisfaction, of penance. And this is according to St. Thomas Aquinas, of course. There is the sufficient satisfaction. In his, his interpretation. Sorry? His interpretation. Yeah. There is not, not from the original text of, of, of uh, uh, the Bible. No, it's from St. Thomas. He is a patristic and he is a pillar in Christianity. So uh, St. Thomas would say that there is two types of uh, satisfaction or penance. And the first one is the sufficient satisfaction. And normally it is incomplete satisfaction or imperfect. And it is described on the willingness of the one offended to accept that atonement as being equal, even though it is not. Let's say I stole ten thousand dollar and I was sentenced to pay you back five thousand, and to accept that, this is the sufficient satisfaction. So it is incomplete, but is accepted even though it is not equal to the offense. And we find example of that in the Old Testament, in the Torah where the Jewish people would go and give uh, sacrifices for their sins, the sacrifice they were offering, the lamb, is not equal to their sin, but God is accepting that. The second one is the retribution or the condign satisfaction. And this satisfaction means theologically perfect satisfaction. It is perfect. And it can remedy a situation by voluntarily undergoing an onerous act in view of the injured rights of another person. And it is a complete remedy to the injury done. And this brings us to the suffering servant. That's why Jesus, God, became a human being in order to redeem our original sin and our sins and to give us the condign, satisfa uh, condign satisfaction. In, in one word. Yeah. I'm not trying to 
Pentru că nu am făcut asta. Cu ce am făcut Who crucified? Well, there is. I said one word. One word. Technically speaking, it was a Roman. No. Yeah. Who pushed for the crucifixion was a Jewish. Yeah, that, that's why I'm asking you how much of the Roman and uh, the Jewish community was involved. And the reason I'm asking this question is because many Jewish people are so happy with the interpretation of Quran and Islam. He wasn't crucified. So it means they are innocent. Though the Christians say, no, 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 he was crucified. So the majority of Christians are mad at Muslims because they say he wasn't crucified. But the majority of Jewish people say, oh, we're innocent. We did not do it. Find out what they did if they claim, if their claim is, is, is right or, or wrong. But it, 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 it is a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, um, debate. Uh, you have a question for me? Well, I don't want to ask you. I, we still have, still yeah, have a couple of minutes. Okay. So, now, is Jesus considered as Messiah or Messiah? In in Quran, in many ayat of the Quran, I can refer you to them. Um, I can even share with you the statistics. Uh, how many times he was mentioned just as Isa, or some other time Isa the Messiah, or Messiah, or Messiah Isa, or Messiah Isa the Messiah. Many times in the Quran, depending actually in the way you know uh, it is addressed and, and, and so on and so forth. So he is considered Al Masih, Messiah, the son of Mary, the son of the Virgin Mary, and Isa, the independent son of those And by the way, just to mention to all of you, there is a chapter in the Quran, chapter 19. Remember that number? This is the title is Maryam. Maryam, Maryam, the word for Maryam and the word is to uh, yeah. yes. yes. um, As a question, what do you think of Prophet Muhammad? That's a really interesting question. And I would like to hear if anyone, I will give my answer because we are running out of time. Yes. I will say it first in Arabic. Sure. Is there anyone here who speak Arabic, by the way? Okay. I don't. Me neither. As, as a question regarding the Prophet Muhammad, I will say in Arabic first. In the Muhammad, يستحق المليح من أجل سلوكه طريق الأنبياء ومن يحب الله. I will translate in English. Muhammad is worthy of all praise by all reasonable men. He walked in the path of the prophets and walked in the track of lovers of God. So that's all I what I have to say about Prophet Muhammad. Can I add a few words? What do you think of him as a prophet and messenger? We see him. In this Quran, 114 chapters, 604 pages, letter by letter, concept by concept, word by word, verse by verse, since the day one of the revelation, till today, till the day of judgment, nothing has been changed. Would I consider him just as a human being? Or no more than human being? <laughs> or much more as a prophet, or much, much more as a messenger. And uh, this is one, one thing I just wanted to share with you, not what he did or what he said. We do have his biography as being authenticated, and you can read his own entire life, what he did, and so on and so forth. And for his companions, and, and so on and so forth. Having 1.7 billion Muslims in the whole world, 
was still much less than the number of the Christians, no, no doubt about it. But in the meantime, uh, one, one major historical fact happened, and we just celebrated this a couple of months ago. It was the seventh month of the lunar calendar, what we call it, the Regent. And uh, that one, it, it, it does really commemorate a miracle for the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. That miracle, after 12 years of struggling and striving, killing and torturing, you name it, happened to him personally and to his companion in Mecca. That wanted to reward him, but in a miracle. So it was that journey at night, call it an Isra or Mi'raj, journey from Mecca to Jerusalem in Palestine. In an animal called al Quraq type of light, maybe in a fraction of a second, he went to that journey. And there, in order to honor him, God has resurrected all the prophets and messengers to pray behind him, including Jesus. Including Jesus. And after that, he was descended along with Gabriel, the angel, to the seventh heaven and beyond to meet God Almighty. There, the prayer was prescribed as a gift to God. And then Moses asked God, And then come back to Mecca. But why Mecca? To Jerusalem in Palestine, and then the heaven, and coming back. In order to have that connectedness between those three points Mecca, Jerusalem and in Medina, where he was uh, uh, dying and buried there. Keep in mind Muslim, keep in mind Christian, keep in mind Jewish people who are connected at the Abrahamic faith. There is no need to emphasize the differences, but let's live together and respect each other and coordinate and cooperate with a lot of things to go. Uh, uh, while we're having our dinner, I was sharing with my wonderful colleague, and last week when I was invited in here, I said, we are in the same world, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, either to sink together or to swim together. Make the choice. We Muslims made the choice to swim together regardless of, of the differences there. Thank you. Traditions have, uh, like the rosary beads, and our Islamic rosary beads we come to spy. Uh, and then I also also want to myself thank the academics for their wonderful display and showing us how to speak about uh, such a vital, important topic. Thank you. So as a reminder, or, yeah, as a reminder, we're going to have our sundown prayer over here at the end. First, we're going to have um, Professor Ali lead us in a closing Christian prayer, and then he's going to talk about an awesome opportunity um, to engage more in religious studies, and then we will have Ryan for announcements, and then we will end in the second prayer. So, Thank you so much, both of you, first. Thank you for all of you, and let me ask you a third question. Did you do your good job tonight? We need more and more and more. 
Not necessarily me. Maybe we'll push our hand. But invite someone else. But we want to keep it done more and more. This is again and again what will bring us much closer. Heart to heart, shoulder to shoulder. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's my turn. So, just before we pray at the end, uh, don't be afraid of asking questions. And many times when you ask someone who has a different uh, religious background than you, it might make you challenge yourself, asking yourself about stuff in your face that for many years you took it for granted. And don't be afraid. If you want to go in your face, you can go in your face without being afraid that he will be a threat for me or I'll be a threat for him. Go ask him, what, that, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? And how do you believe with that? And he will ask you the same. So it's an opportunity for you to go in your own face. And for our conclusion, I chose a prayer uh, written by St. Francis. And St. Francis, uh, he went all the way from Italy to Egypt to meet the Caliph and ask him to stop the war. So I think he is a good example for us how to reach to each other. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of God Almighty, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is love, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you. My prayer, our Lord, help us, guide us, support us, have us much closer to each other, and keep us faithful. Amen. Amen. Listen. And as I promise you, we'll perform the Madrid prayer, sunset prayer, there in the corner. Just watch if you'd like to. You don't have to come and join us. But for Muslims in this room, you can join me. I will be uh, leading uh, the prayer. Thank you. Okay. Before we conclude, I just want to share with you about this program. For whoever is interested in interreligious dialogue, there is a grant that is given every year by Russell Berry. So if you want to check it, go to the website or Google Russell Berry Fellowship in Interreligious Studies, and you can find it. And thank you for, again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamdi. Thank you. And thank you for MSA and coming Catholic. Hang on tight. Almost done. Good evening, my name is Ryan Devonito, board of Tommy Kaplan. So while Ali brought up opportunity in the religious dialogue, big C world, let's think the microscope. Here are some of your religious opportunities here. As we see here, um, we encourage you to keep going with the community building bridges among communities, religious communities. We have here J. Phillips Center faith and learning. And Dr. Hans Gustafsson is your main contact if you have any questions. Um, they often have uh, provide rich events concerning about uh, you know, religious dialogue. Um, and I encourage you, you know, type UST, um, type UST, um, J. Phillips Center if you have any questions, and sign, sign yourself up if you on the email list if you're interested. If you want to continue this type of environment of interreligious dialogue, the Office of Spirituality hosts a six-part series called PCS. 
Peace Mules happens on Convo and involves luncheon among a group of students with different religious backgrounds. We eat together and have civil conversations about our cultural and religious lives. I'm currently in it this semester, and it's fun. Um, this semester we have a variety of you know, representation, Roman Catholics, Muslims, agnostics who are interested in exploring other faith systems, and many more. For more information, type USD Peace Meals, or you can contact Sarah Shamson. Now time for announcements. Just a few things to say. I'm not saying everything tonight for the sake of time. Um, there have been many speculations about when the chapel will close. Um, this is the last weekend where we're going to hold Mass in the chapel. So just be aware of that. For everybody, um, this Thursday, Convo, um, it will be the groundbreaking breaking for construction of the Iverson Center for Faith and the chapel renovation in the north entrance of the chapel at 12. That is all I have. Thank you.